So, welcome everybody to another episode of uh, Software Architecture on Stream. Um, this time around in English, as you can probably tell. Uh, and our guest is uh, Rebecca Parsons. So, I'm glad to have you here and it's an honor to welcome you on the show. Uh, so, Rebecca, do you want to say a few words about yourself, what you're doing and what your background is? Sure. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Well, um, I actually started programming when I was about 13 years old. and. Uh, uh, fell in love with it from a very early age, and uh, uh, I've had what some would refer to as a rather checkered past. I don't know uh, if that particular saying translates well in, in, in German, but I've worked for you know, uh, a manufacturing company, for a computer company, in startups, for, the, for government research and academia. Uh, I've, I've worked... Uh, uh, for the last uh, 20 plus years now at, at ThoughtWorks as, as, as a consultant. So I've seen lots of different aspects of, of, the, uh, of, the, of the software industry um, over, over a period of time. Um, and I have a particular interest um, in, in architecture. Um, I did my doctoral research in parallel and distributed computation and, and programming languages. And so, um, I guess I have a rather eclectic uh, set, set of interests within the technology area as well. Yeah, that sounds uh, sounds really interesting, and I'm I'm glad to have you on the show with uh, so much experience and uh, such an interesting um, uh, uh, CV. So, um, what we are going to talk about is evolutionary architecture, and as as a matter of fact, uh, the reason why we are even talking to one another is that you are doing a keynote at uh, the Software Architecture Gathering, and uh, the guys from Software Architecture Gathering were so kind to put us in contact and uh, allow us to to have you here. And in your abstract to the keynote, you say that uh, you are referring to agile processes. Um, so one. I don't know, provocative question would be, so if you're agile, why would you even have software architecture? Because, you know, you can't be sure about anything. And if there is anything that we learn, then we can just uh, react to it in an agile manner. So, and, and architecture is so very, you know, inflexible. So why would you have architecture in an agile process? Well, I've actually spent a lot of time thinking about the role of an architect um, with respect to the agile software development process. And one of the things uh, to realize is that a software development team has a very clear objective. Get features out as quickly and efficiently as possible. And it's, it's, it's very much a short to medium term perspective. They have a business stakeholder that wants to get something accomplished and, and that's their goal. But when you step back from it, an architect is responsible for the overall enterprise value of the full IT estate. So the architect's time scale is more long-term to possibly medium-term. And so there are aspects of building a system that will impact the medium and long-term viability of the entire IT estate. And somebody's got to worry about that. It doesn't matter if you've got a, this wonderful little, you know, agile de delivery engine that can that, that can efficiently and quickly get out business features, because you've got all of these other considerations: resiliency, the ability to operate, um, recoverability, um, emerging standards around uh, privacy or security, and so there are these concerns that are shared outside of a delivery team. Now, this is not to say that I believe that architects should sit off in their little corner, you know, and rule on, on their subjects. Um, but architecture is still important from the perspective of, of an agile project. You have to decide what are the things that matter from an architectural perspective? What are going to be the critical success drivers? And if you don't understand those, you're not going to be able to make the, the right kinds of decisions as you're faced with not only changing business requirements, but changing environmental and, you know, the technology ecosystem as those changes come into being. Mm -hmm. um, another thing that I noted when I was reading your abstract is that you were referring to patterns and uh, patterns seem to be sort of 
an old thing. So yeah, back in the 90s, there was obviously the, the, uh, the Gang of Four book about patterns, but that's on the code level and that's quite long ago. So um, how are patterns relevant to modern day uh, software architecture in your opinion? Well, th think about the two books from the early 2000s, the uh, patterns of of uh, enterprise integration architecture or integration integration architecture patterns uh, by uh, G Gregor Hope and of course the patterns of of enterprise uh, application architecture uh, that 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 Martin uh, Fowler wrote with with a couple of of thought workers. What what I see when I think about evolutionary architecture is is a is an expansion, if you will, of the notion of patterns as ways to solve for different architectural concerns. Um, you can think of a, a kernel-based architecture as solving one particular kind of architectural problem. Microservices is another architectural pattern, hub and spoke. So there are lots of different architectural patterns that you can think about. And if we talk about them at the pattern level, you can start to see how those different characteristics impact different architectural requirements. How one particular architecture might in fact be more resilient um, or more scalable. And so that, that's why I think patterns are important to, to talk about architecture is you can abstract away from some of the some of the nitty gritty details of the implementation and say, what are the trade offs I might need to make between, you know, high throughput and security, or how might I address my problem of scalability or elasticity. Mm -hmm. And um, you did write a book about evolutionary architecture together with Patrick Kuhr. And uh, actually, we, we did an episode with, with Patrick not too long ago, I think by the beginning of this year, and Neil Ford. So um, is that book a collection of patterns? Is that what it is? Or uh, do you use that it's at all? The, the, the patterns language really has evolved a bit later. Um, and in fact, later this week, um, Neil and I will be talking about um, how how to approach a second edition of the Building Evolutionary Architectures book. Um, and I suspect that is going to figure a bit more prominently. Um, but the the notions of evolutionary architecture actually um, take a lot of, of inspiration from another one of my, my uh, uh, favorite research areas, which is evolutionary computation, and in, in specifically uh, genetic algorithms and, and, and genetic programming. And, and what a lot of the, the book is about is this notion of a fitness function, where you will specify for your architecture, these are the architectural characteristics that matter. This is the level of scalability that, that I require. This is the, the um, uh, level of robustness. How many nines do I need? How many concurrent users? Um, what what are my security requirements? What are my observability re requirements? And that's a lot of what the book is talking about is how we translate what we want our architecture to achieve into a fitness function so we can actually figure out have we achieved it? And do we continue to achieve it over time? Because that's one of the things that many architectural processes don't do a good job of is how, how, how do we know six months or a year down the line that those architectural characteristics that we wanted in a system still exist? Hmm. And that's what the fitness functions are all about. Yeah. So sort of the 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 obvious follow-up question would be about, around the fitness function but i really want to to spend a few minutes about something that you just mentioned and that uh, might not even be known to everyone um, and that is uh, genetic programming and genetic uh, genetic algorithms that's because i did a diploma thesis about it so can you say a few words about that and uh, what what this area even is because i think it's so very fascinating and there are not too many people who even know the term, I guess. So at least we should, uh, we should um, explain that on, on that level. 
Well, I got involved uh, with uh, genetic algorithms to work on a, a problem uh, that was obsoleted by new bio uh, 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 molecular biology technology, but I was working uh, at Los Alamos National Laboratory on the Human Genome Project. And at that time, um, the sequencing technology was such that you couldn't sequence much more than say five or 10,000 base pairs reliably. And of course that, you know, the, the human genome is massive in comparison to that. And so we had what was called the fragment assembly problem of, you know, they would do the sequencing by replicating the, the bigger genome, randomly chopping it up into lots of different pieces, sequencing all the little pieces, and then you had to put the jigsaw puzzle back together. And people had used techniques like simulated annealing and some more traditional uh, optimization techniques. And um, I was working uh, with a molecular biologist at, um, at Los Alamos, as well as with Stephanie Forrest. Uh, from the University of New Mexico. And it's like, well, let's try a genetic algorithm. And basically with a genetic algorithm, you have a fitness function that tells you what constitutes good. And it's actually easiest to explain this uh, using a more traditional computer science problem. So we'll use the traveling salesman problem. So in this traveling salesman problem, you have a list of cities that the uh, salesperson has to navigate and you want to, order those cities in such a, a way that the salesperson will visit them all, but in the shortest distance. So that's a very obvious fitness function. Given a list of cities, what A, does it visit all of the cities and what is the distance? And you wanna minimize what the distance is. So in a genetic algorithm, the fitness function is really what's driving it. But then you have other operators that sit around it. You have to decide how to represent your problem in something that is effectively just a string. Well, in the tra traveling salesman problem, that's easy. It's, you know, the, the, the cities in order. Um, then you have what's called a crossover operator because genetic algorithms are inspired by biological evolution. And so you will take two possible answers and use a crossover operator, which is just some way of taking two and mushing it into one. Uh, and then you'll have a mutation operator that might make a random mutation somewhere. So in the case of traveling salesman problem, it might swap two cities. And then you select you know, your new generation on the basis of the fitness of all of the individuals that you generated on the basis of your crossover and mutation operators and using that fitness function as a way of regulating the percentage of population of various various kinds and and um, genetic algorithms have been proven to be actually quite effective at solving many different optimization problems mm -hmm. and that's i think why why it's so very interesting because it's it's so clearly modeled after the bio uh, biological um, uh, role model and uh, it's so very close to it um, and as you said, it is quite successful in 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 particular in complex um, areas. So, what is a fitness function for a software architecture then? So, because you just said, okay, for the traveling salesman, it would be are all cities um, visited, and is it how long is the path? So, what is uh, a fitness function for for a software architecture then? Well, there are, there are a wide variety of fitness functions. Um, for example, it might be um, I have a performance requirement set that says that you know all screens have to respond in less than a second. So that would be a fitness function, and you would run that against the performance all of your different screens and say whether or not it it matches. Or perhaps you have uh, you need to be able to deal with ten thousand simultaneous users with um, performance no less than than this. So that would be a, another fitness function. Actually, one of the most interesting fitness functions um, is Netflix Simian Army. Um, Net Netflix uh, has this whole range of, of monkeys, chaos monkeys that basically just go in and disrupt mm. things to, to see what happens. Um, but they also have um, 
for example, particular uh, per, uh, particular parts of the Sim Simian army that will check to see, is your restful endpoint properly configured? That is a fitness function. If you're, you're, you, are, you are querying a, a, a restful endpoint, if it isn't properly configured, it's pulled out of the ecosystem. Uh, so fitness functions within software and architecture are not new things. We're just taking taking this notion of, of a fitness function, applying it to many of the kinds of tests and metrics and other measures that we put in place for, for software to, to help reinforce the idea that this is where we're defining what good looks like. What are the important outcomes or behaviors we want our system and architecture to exhibit for our users and for the people who are running, uh, running the application. And so our target architecture moves from being some, you know, big block diagram hanging on the wall to this system. It's effectively the composition of all of the individual fitness functions where you've encoded. The, these are the architectural outcomes that I want to achieve. Um, and would each of these, so, so you were talking about, uh, you know, response times and uh, these kinds of, as an example, um, and these can be translated to some tests, like some performance or load test. Uh, so would each part of that fitness function be translated to a test in the ideal world, or is it even translatable? In an ideal world, all of the tests would be automated, yes. All of the fitness functions would be automated, but some of them you may choose not to. And so the key point about a fitness function is less about whether it's automated or not, but more that you and I will never disagree on whether or not a system passes. So saying the code must be maintainable, that is not a fitness function. What do you specifically mean by maintainable? A fitness function might be cyclomatic complexity no greater than 30. It might be adherence to a particular coding standard. Uh, there might be other measures of software quality having to do with coupling or, or uh, length of classes, those kinds of things. Um, that's the important character, uh, characteristic of a fitness function is you are specifying this is specifically what it means. And therefore you and I will know whether or not our particular system is exhibiting that characteristic because it is unambiguous. Just like the, the change we made with agile software development is, is, you know, the users were in control of the acceptance tests, but it had to be unambiguous. There, there couldn't be this, this, oh, well, yes, it test passes the test. Well, no, it doesn't. You should not ever be in a situation where you disagree on whether or not that fitness function has been fulfilled. And uh, talking about acceptance tests and you know the customer role, so would the fitness function also be something that I talk to the customer about, the customer role about? It depends on on what aspect of the architecture that they, that you're talking about. Um, many of the fitness functions are are more about the architectural abilities, so performance and load and scalability and all of that. Uh, accessibility, though, would, would be a major source of, of uh, fitness function re requirements. Um, and there may, there may be others in terms of usability. Um, and so those might be things that, that you might test out with, with the ultimate end customers. Uh, again, a fitness function that, that says the system must be usable is not terribly interesting. Um, but if you use the, the, the drive for usability to start to have a conversation on, okay, what does that mean about where I place my buttons and what size the font is and, and how does it respond, you know, as you move from, you know, a mobile phone to a tablet platform, all of those kinds of things. Yes, those, those two can be thought of as fitness functions. Excellent. So um, we had we had a meeting to prepare this interview, and during that meeting, you you said that fitness functions are also important for um, architectural governance. So what is architectural governance governance, and how is a fitness function related to architectural governance? 
Well, if you look at the way architectural governance has traditionally been done in the past, um, it was very implementation driven. This is the set of tools that you're going to use not why you might use those tools, but this is the set of tools that, that, that you will use. Um, and it was very review driven. Okay, I need to sign off on your component diagram or I need to sign off on this or that. One of the things that we've learned over the, the you know, 20 some odd year, years of Agile is to start to think about how can we speed up these processes? Um, and so if you have, for example, um, a coding standard, no cyclic dependencies, well, why in the world would you do a, a manual code review to look for cyclic dependencies when you could just as easily put a syntax check into the build that will fail the build if there's a cyclic dependency? Now, the advantage of doing governance through things like these fitness functions is once you put that in, no one ever has to think about a cyclic dependency again or a cyclomatic complexity that's you know 140 because the build fails. And so the more the governance can be encapsulated in these fitness functions and in particular fitness functions that, that help us understand what's the outcome we're trying to achieve, the more governance can be done that way, the more first you free up the time of the architects to do things that require brain power. Okay, well, I need to have this level of responsiveness. So I'm looking at using this caching strategy, but using this caching strategy violates our staleness requirements um, hmm. for, for security. How do I balance these things? You know, how might I solve this problem? Those are the kinds of things you want your architects thinking about, not doing a desk check to see whether somebody's introduced a cyclic complexity, a, a, a cyclic dependency. Um, so that's the first advantage of, of governance through fitness functions is you're freeing up the time of the architect to do much more value added work uh, as opposed to you know, manual checks that could just as easily be automated. But the second advantage um, is one of the things that we're trying to do is move away from a focus on implementations to a focus on outcomes. I want you to achieve this level of scalability, not you will use this approach to scalability. By shifting it to the outcome, that allows the delivery teams to potentially take advantage of technological innovations that might make it much easier to achieve that level of scalability. And they shouldn't have to consult the architects if they're achieving the outcome. Now, yes, there, there's probably something around technological sprawl and all of that kind of stuff. And, there, and we, you know, we've, we've seen both the advantages of you know, anarchy and letting people do whatever tools they want to do, as well as something that's just so locked down that the people can't make the right choices. Obviously, you still have to manage mm -hmm. that. But if you start to focus on this is the outcome I want to achieve, this is the desired behavior, then the development teams can start to take advantage of innovations that are happening in the technology ecosystem to say, I can do this better. I can make this more supportable. I can lessen the strain of getting the level of scalability if I can use this particular technology. Mm -hmm. um, now, what we are discussing is actually evolutionary architecture. So, so what you said is that um, the fitness function would help to sort of let teams self-organize and uh, to to have unambiguous goals for for uh, the project but how is it relevant to evolutionary architecture because it provides the guardrails for decisions that that that, that are made um, if i'm looking at a particular approach to 
one of my architectural characteristics, you know, um, and I can't meet my fitness function, that tells me I've got, you know, I've got to come up with, 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 a diff, with a different approach. So we're using these fitness functions as a way of ensuring that we have the architectural characteristics that we've decided are important for this particular application um, and that those don't degrade over time because that's what very often happens is, is as you know as systems evolve sure they get deployed to big fanfare you know and then new features start to come in and things start to get more brittle and it takes longer to change things and you know um, the, the fitness functions are there's the guardrail to say no, you can't make that change because you've now broken one of the architectural outcomes that has been deemed important. Mm -hmm. And that's the role that fitness function plays is it guides. So the actual definition for an evolutionary architecture is that it supports guided incremental change across multiple dimensions. And this guiding is what the fitness function does. The change hotspot is. Um, so let's imagine that I'm, you know, I'm you're consulting me and I'm an architecture at some customer and I'm I'm telling you, okay, I know that this needs to be flexible because this is a, a change hotspot and I know that this will happen in the future. This is what, what's going to, to, to take place. Uh, so I will build in some flexibility here. What's your answer to that? Is it you ain't gonna need it, or what? How, how would you tackle that problem? I'm a consultant, so I'm going to say it depends. Um, <laughs> but what what it depends on is what is the basis of you knowing that? If you have a particular, let's say you're you're using a a, a particular middleware product, and you know what their product roadmap is and you know that there's something coming on their product roadmap that is something you're gonna to wanna to take advantage of. Absolutely, make, make your architecture adaptable to take advantage of that new feature once it comes because there's a really high probability that that's going to happen. But, but in some of these other cases, what, one of the examples that, that Neil likes to use a lot when we're giving a, a public talk, I, I will bet anybody in the room, 100 of whatever currency you have, if you can guarantee to me what JavaScript framework you will be using in two years time. And that's what people do, they laugh. Of course you can't do that, it hasn't been written yet. How can you predict how to make your front end architecture adaptable to take advantage of a new framework and you have no idea what it's going to look like? You have no idea how it's going to differ from the one you're using right now. So how do you take advantage of that? Certain things you can know and it's, it's it's actually a very similar argument to to the uh, to the Yagni articles of of old. The you ain't going to need it. Well, I don't know in this particular story yet that I'm going to have to talk to the mainframe. So why should I even think about talking to the mainframe? You know, your downloads are going to come from the mainframe. You know, just because it hasn't appeared on your current story list doesn't mean you don't need to think about the fact that this stuff is going to come down from the mainframe. There are certain things that, that just professionalism dictate that you pay attention to. Oh, well, I don't know that there's going to be multiple stores. So I don't, why don't I hardcore the number of stores at, at 845? No, you're not gonna do that. You're gonna put it in as, as, a, as, as, a, as a symbol. Um, those kinds of things, you, you can, you'll see the same thing at the architectural level. There are some you know are going to happen and certainly Build to anticipate those, but don't try to get out, you know, your crystal ball or your Ouija board or whatever and figure out, okay, this is when this next, you know, revolution in how we interact with computers is going to happen. And therefore I must be ready for it. Mm -hmm. We can't do it. 
So we spoke about the, the fitness function and um, what, what evolution, like what, what the goal of an evolutionary architecture is and why it's called evolutionary architecture. How would I make my architecture evolutionary? What are some, some basic techniques to sort of make it happen? Well, generally I talk about uh, four sample techniques. And to me, one of the critical enablers for evolutionary architecture is continuous delivery. I mean, when I first started talking about evolutionary architecture, people would come up to me, you know, and they'd whisper after my talk, don't you think you're being professionally irresponsible to talk about changing architecture? Architecture is the rock, it's the foundation. How, how could you evolve the foundation? It must be, you know, and, and they get all worked up about this. I don't get that reaction anymore. Very often I get, I know I need it, I just don't know how to do it. So similar to, to, to your question. Um, but one of the things that makes it possible are the disciplines and the underlying techniques and approaches that come from continuous delivery. Because the, 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 the people who were saying, you know, this, this can be disruptive because you know, architecture is defined as the things that are hard to change. It can be pretty disruptive to make some of these major changes. And so you want to have the utmost confidence that you know exactly the environment that you're deploying into. You know exactly that things are properly configured so that you can focus your attention on, have I done something wrong in the change that I know I'm making as opposed to something that is completely unrelated. And we've all been through deployments you know, in, in the past where you know, it's that sigh of relief. Oh, I didn't get yelled at by the CEO this time because we actually managed to get it out without the system collapsing around our ears. Um, and we would celebrate more the fact that the deployment didn't fail than the, than the features that we actually deployed. Like, you know, that, that would come when we actually got some sleep. Uh, and so continuous delivery is one of the important underlying foundational techniques because you want to be able to focus your attention on these are the things that are going to be impacted by this change. Mm -hmm. A second important enabling technique is the ability to refactor databases. I've been involved in the agile movement for a long time. And, you know, people would say, well, it's okay for the developers, but you know, I'm a QA and I can't test everything until everything's done. Um, I'm a business analyst. I need to be able to lay out the entire map of, of the user journey before we can get started. And role by role by role, all of them started to realize that A, you can't know everything up front. Something is going to change. I'm going to have to figure out how to be able to introduce new things into my process. So how can I actually go ahead and embrace the fact that this is going to change? The group I've always had the most sympathy for is the DBAs. Because the minute a database is in production, you can't change that database without doing a data migration. And data migration is hard. Conceptually, it's easy. What could be harder? You copy it from this to that. What could possibly go wrong? It always goes wrong. And much like code refactoring, and I'm using refactoring mm -hmm. in the precise term, which is those small changes, the database refactoring approach said, we're going to take those large schema changes and decompose them into the atomic changes that are necessary. And for each one of those changes, you also introduce, and here's how I migrate to just support that change. Now, that doesn't mean that all those little data bombs from 1984 aren't still there, but it's a whole lot easier to find them when, when you are looking at the migration from the perspective, I'm making this one change. So what is this one 
you know, adding a new column or splitting a column. How did that go wrong with this data element? And so it simplifies data migration. And you cannot evolve a system if you can't evolve its data. Mm -hmm. And so to me, that's a critical technique for evolutionary architecture. Um, I want to spend a few minutes on, on this because I think this is really interesting. Um, so first of all, if I understand you correctly, what you're proposing is the fine-grained refactoring approach that the original refactoring book also spoke about, but this time around for databases. So like adding uh, a single column, or I, th I think your example was to split up a column or things of that nature. Mm -hmm. yes. uh, okay, so I mean, the, um, the, the, the refactoring on the code level um, to me is something where I would do, I don't know, lots of refactoring every hour. It, it's, it's a continuous process. Mm -hmm. That's sort of yes. the core. And uh, in particular for, for databases, there is this school that says, um, I think it's, it's from Etsy, uh, we take one, week of, uh, one day of the week and this is where we are going to, uh, to roll out the next evolution of our database schema, which basically means that you pile up the changes over a week and then you do that one change because it's so risky to do, to do the database changes. So, and that's a different approach. So are you proposing this fine-grained refactoring approach with many changes every day, hour, on the database level in production? Or are you rather on this, this Etsy site where, where you would do that, that one change, uh, that's, that one pile of changes, I should say, every week? It's, it's more towards the, the SD, at, Etsy approach. And, and, and let me be, be clear, uh, there is a book called Refactoring Databases with the subtitle Evolutionary Database Design. Um, it's over 10 years old, but it's still a com completely unappreciated book. Um, it was written by um, my colleague at ThoughtWorks Promote Sadalgi, as well as uh, Scott Ambler, who at the time was with IBM. Um, we keep telling Promote they need to re-release the book and swap the title and subtitle and call it evolutionary database design and then refactoring databases. Uh, but but the, the beauty of that book is really that it focused on the problems that the database administrators and and database specialists were actually having, which is you can't go willy-nilly changing the database because we have to do the migration. And so it 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 focused really on the very real problems that that were were the case at that time. Um, and so I would definitely encourage anyone, if, if, if you're having this problem, go out and buy that book. Yeah, and I will, I will definitely put a link on, on the show notes because um, I actually bought that book at one point, but I should probably also reread it. Um, Okay, so, so what you're saying is um, you would still pile up some changes and do them like weekly mm -hmm. or, or daily or whatever. Um, what's the, the third technique that you propose? So there, th this one is a bit more controversial. Um, if you look at the way different parts of a distributed architecture uh, work together, you, you have two major choices. You can go with an orchestration approach or a choreography approach. And the, the, the way I explain this, if you think about an orchestra, there is a conductor and the orchestra does exactly what the conductor tells it to do. Everybody is paying attention to that conductor. You have an, effectively a single point of failure. But there are errors that will never happen in an orchestrated system. It's the orchestrator's job to handle all of these different kinds of problems. Whereas for a choreographer, again, think about a, da a dance performance. The choreographer is not out there when the, the company is performing, telling everybody where they need to go. They all know what they're supposed to do and they know that they might have to respond 
to something that happens. So I'm supposed to leap gracefully and somebody is going, supposed to catch me, but he trips and falls onto the floor. Well, I'm not going to leap expecting him to go ahead and catch me because he's flat on his face. So I'm going to do something that will allow me to get to the next place that I know I have to get to. You distribute control, but when you dis distribute control, the advantage is now I can move those pieces around because each piece really knows how to do its thing regardless. Um, but I pay a cost in significantly increased complexity because now each of the, those individual performers need to know what to do in all of those different error scenarios where if there's an orchestrator, the individual performers just say, something went wrong, please tell me what to do now. Um, all of that error handling is, is centralized. So you get a lot more flexibility in a choreographed architecture, but you pay a significant cost. Depending on what your other abilities are, you might decide that that level of evolvability is simply not appropriate for you. But when we think about uh, evolutionary architecture, we are looking at all aspects of the architecture. What, how, how are you breaking things down into components? How are those components communicating and coordinating, coordinating their activity? What is the data architecture and what are the requirements for data consistency and transactionality? All of those questions come into play and you might decide, you know, even though I could keep these things very loosely coupled, I have to change them at the same time anyway so I might as well more tightly couple them to make my performance targets easier to meet. You know, so evolvability is another one of those illities that you might have to trade off, like with performance, like with scalability, all of those different things. What is most important? And something like choreography is a technique that you may not want to use because it's too complex and it's not worth paying the complexity cost to get that level of evolvability that maybe you can get some other way. Mm -hmm. So there, there, there's, there's an, another I example. Yeah, I think it's very interesting because I think oftentimes uh, people have this, this tendency to think about end-to-end. Uh, -end. I think you already mentioned that, like, like um, uh, business analysts that say, okay, we need to ro roll out this huge map about everything and it's really, really complex and choreography might be one way to, to battle that, right? I think that's that's maybe one, one aspect there. Yes. Uh, um, there is a question by uh, Dude Root on, on uh, YouTube and uh, he says, he or she says, uh, what about the fact having the database migration as part of the feature uh, release often? So I guess what, what, uh, what um, that person is asking is whether uh, if you release a feature, you should have sort of a database migration script that says, okay, this is how we are going to change that database once we release that, uh, that feature. So would be, that be an approach that you would think is advisable? I would still decompose whatever those changes are into those uh, atomic pieces, uh, particularly if you're dealing with uh, a database that's been in production for several years, because data does not age well. Um, mm -hmm. And um, but, but that that is that is really one way way to think about it. OK. You know, this is the change I need to make for that particular feature. And and conceptually, what what you do is is you you decompose whatever that schema change is into the component parts, and then you just compose all of the changes and compose all of the migrations and run that. But but yes, or organizing it around the the, the, the feature um, is is certainly one one way to think about it. But if I understand you correctly, what you're saying is it should be more fine-grained. It shouldn't be just one script for one feature, but it should be a more fine-grained, uh, more fine-grained than that. You you might still have one script, but within that script, you would want it decomposed so that so that you could identify what aspect of the change 
might have caused that migration to fail because that's that you know that's the real sticker is yeah you know, i've got you know 200 million rows and i run the data migration and i get you know 150,000 failures okay where do i start yeah whereas if if you decompose it yes you're still going to have that same 150,000 failures but you're going to know okay these 10,000 relate to this part of the change okay what's this part of the change what could have gone wrong sample a few of them to look at you know figure out what the patterns might be and then figure out how you have to fix the migration for those 10,000 and then you go on to the 15,000 that failed on this stage as opposed to trying to deal with all 150,000 at once where you have no idea why they failed just that it didn't work um Great. So, so those were three out of the four techniques. So, what's the fourth one? The, the the final one that I talk about, and you know, there 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 are more than four. I, I I'm trying to pick ones from from different parts. Um, mm -hmm. Is to think about contract testing, because one of the things we're trying to do in an evolutionary architecture is to support as much independence as possible. So let's say. You and I and Neil all rely on each other to some extent, but we're building independent services. So I'm going to give you and Neil an acceptance test that documents the assumptions I'm making of you. And you're going to give to me and Neil and Neil's, you know, and, and then we start ignoring each other. I'm running your tests and Neil's tests you're running my tests and Neil's tests and everybody's happy and we're completely ignoring each other. It doesn't matter what kind of change we're making, we're completely ignoring each other. And then your test that you gave to me breaks. That means that I'm trying to make some kind of change that is going to alter the contract I have with you. Neil's test is still running. So we both still continue to ignore Neil we have a discussion on how I can achieve what I need to achieve while still satisfying your assumptions. We make whatever changes are necessary, re-exchange tests, and we go back to ignoring each mm. other. And Neil has never even had to talk to either one of us. These contract tests have the additional advantage of effectively documenting what are the assumptions everybody is making about everybody else. And that's what some of the best enterprise architects I ever knew. That was the real value is they understood how information flowed through the enterprise, the assumptions that different systems made about each other. They understood all of those things. By getting those into code, getting those documented, you're taking away that single point of failure of what happens if that architect leaves because all of a sudden, all of that institutional knowledge would just go away. But from an evolutionary arch architecture perspective, it allows us to work completely independently, evolving ourselves and knowing, okay, now I need to go talk to Eberhard because his test is just broken. <laughs> and so I know I have to talk to you. We both know we can continue to ignore Neil unless what we come up with happens to break Neil's tests for one of us. And then we have to bring Neil into the conversation. Mm -hmm. But it allows the maximum amount of, of independent work. You can evolve things as is appropriate for your system, safe in the knowledge that I'm going to continue to be perfectly happy with what you're giving, regardless of what changes you are making. So it increases your scope to be able to change things however you want. Mm -hmm. by having these strong contract tests. Um, I like how, how those different techniques are actually on, on very different levels. And some of those parts are not even not something that you would probably consider architecture, like like mm -hmm. the, when, when you think about it in, in traditional terms. Um, one thing that I would also be interested in, so um, 
oftentimes there is this sort of tension between uh, the technical people and the business people and business people don't really see why you would in invest in a clean architecture so and and or an evolutionary architecture or architecture at all so um what's your take on that how would you how, how would you try to approach that problem or what advice would you give with this in, in this yeah. regard well, well there's two different sets of advice and i'm going to start with you have an old crusty architecture and you're trying to convince somebody to let you improve that architecture because that's really the harder of the two problems if you're starting with a green field it's you have to do something you you have to make decisions and, and it's, so mm. it's usually not too hard to convince people to let you make good decisions if you're starting greenfield so it's normally the brownfield that's the problem and one way i approach this is is to talk about you know the decreasing the cost of change and the time to market because one of the things that we have seen um, over the years is this increasing expectation from our business users that our systems just aren't changing fast enough and it's like okay well if you want it to change fast enough you have to give me the opportunity to, to invest in it and these are the ways you know, this is the strategy that I'm going to use. Now, a big problem in that conversation is usually the fact that a few years ago, they said, okay, we're going to, you know, get, get, give us, you know, three months and we're going to clean up the architecture. We're going to clean up the code, get rid of all the technical debt. Um, and so they got the three months and now they're back saying, oh, it's a mess again. This is where the fitness functions come in, and in particular, the disciplines of introducing these fitness functions into continually, continuously monitoring the adherence of the system to those fitness functions. Because I can say, if you let me clean it up this time, it can't ever get back into this shape because I'm gonna break the build if somebody starts to violate our layering and I'm going to break the build if somebody gives me this monstrosity and I'm going to break the build da 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 and so you can demonstrate that you have the governance through the fitness functions to ensure that th this never goes wrong again mm. the other part of making this argument is to focus where the pain is the worst not where the worst problem is but where the pain is the worst and you can usually get some quick wins that demonstrate to your to your stakeholders okay this problem actually can get better they just took away this significant source of pain for me so the, the, that those are the two pieces of, of advice use the fitness functions to ensure your, to reassure your stakeholder, we're, we can't backslide. This isn't going to happen again. And then find early pain points that you can address and show and and show some early progress. Mm. Excellent. Um, I'm afraid we are a little bit. Um, we we are almost done concerning the time, but there is still one question from um, about the the uh, contract. Uh, contract driven con uh, consum consumer driven contract testing the the contract tests mm -hmm. um, and the question is how do you deal with versions of contracts if, if the other part is evolving faster so there is one part that does some changes and the other one is not there yet well what what is what these tests tell you is when there's a problem so it may be that you know, your ability to evolve your system is is significantly greater than mine and so you've come out with lots and lots of duty but as long as you're giving me tests that that still pass for me and and my tests are still passing for you the fact that you're evolving much more quickly isn't a problem 
where we get to the problem is, okay, now something that you want to do breaks one of those tests. And that's, and I can't solve that problem. At least we know that now we have to have the conversation. There may be workarounds that we can put into place. Maybe you can keep mm. the old service mm. running for me longer and do a parallel right. run. Um, but it may be the case that you have to slow down because something has to be fixed on my side and I'm just taking longer. I can't fix those problems um, with, but, but at least, at least we know the problem is there and we know the source of the problem so that we can come up with a strategy to mitigate it. Okay. So one final question. Um, so what would be the one advice that you would give an architect if there was just one advice that you could give to him or her? One of the most common problems I see with architects is they still want to talk too much about the technology. And, you know, sometime in the future, all businesses will understand technology and will have technologically savvy CEOs and CFOs and CEOs running all around. But for right now, architects need to speak a bit more in the language of what is the business goal of the organization. Because the CFO doesn't really care about some minutia on the middleware. They care about functionality. They care about cost. They care about um, are our end customers getting what they need. So our architects for the moment still need to be that communication bridge between the technology community within the organization and the business stakeholders. And we need to do a better job of communicating in their language because we're not going to get what we want otherwise. <laughs> Yeah, I really like that that advice. So uh, thanks a lot. Um, I'm really looking to forward to your to your keynote at uh, Software Architecture Gathering, and um, the the organizers of Software Architecture Gathering were so kind to uh, give me a discount code for fifteen percent. That would be SAG twenty one under by EW under by fifteen. Uh, but I will also put that in, in the notes and uh, it's all actually already in the chat. So if you want to see Rebecca's keynotes and all the other uh, uh, interesting stuff from, from the conference, uh, feel free to register. Uh, thanks a lot for joining. Um, I really enjoyed uh, the conversation. Um, and uh, yeah, I hope you, you have a, a great week and, and a, a great conference at uh, Software Architecture Gathering. So thanks a lot. Thank you for having me, Everhart. Thank you.